So everybody, um, I am speaking with Mike Figueredo of the Humanist Report, and who is somebody that was one of the sources that I really started going to back, I want to say even like 16-ish. Was wow. it 16 ish? When did when were you when did you start like really doing stuff? Because it was like Kyle and you and Rational mm -hmm. National, and there were like a handful of people, and that was it. Yeah, I started in 2015, but I didn't really ramp up until 2016. Um, and that's yeah, that you're like one of the the original uh, viewers. I, that's I awesome. Might, I might I might be, and what's funny is I'm that for a lot of people for some reason, like even Jamarl, and I don't even and I don't even watch the Progressive Soapbox as much anymore. But I've been following him and one like since very very early early on. So that's you know, you so know that's so about. awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I I've been on his show as well. That's so cool that you you're like um you've been following all these channels and whatnot. It, well, it's weird because yeah. I have two, but I don't like. I try to force myself to not watch progressive media because I feel like unless I finish like my show and the topics that I've already discussed, if I watch like Kyle or David Dole, then I feel yeah. like they're going to influence my opinion, and I want people to get like my opinion. Otherwise, like, what's the point of watching? different shows you know what i mean so i try to avoid indie media but i still really do enjoy it like once i'm done with my thing for the week and i'm like okay i talked about this now let's see what kyle says about it you know then that's that's where i where i get indie media but it's it's nice to have like these personalities that you follow throughout the years and yeah. grow with and it's interesting to think that like even though i know that that's happening people are watching you know my channel grow and they're growing with me because i've been doing the same thing over the years it's just weird to think about it like from this personal perspective yeah, it's really cool, though. I mean, and I know that there has been talk. I've certainly heard Jordan Cheriton talk about the idea of there being like sort of this um, like a network, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of like real. But it, it almost seems like it's impossible to do something like that with the amount of egos in the mix and that mm -hmm. inevitably that that becomes a problem. And it's unfortunate because there are some seriously good people that are doing this right now you know, that it oh, would yeah. be a really good coalition. When even putting egos aside, if if egos weren't the issue, which they certainly are, and I'm, I'm to blame as well, um, but if egos weren't the issue, then politics is so messy. And even if you're on the same side, even if you're like so close on that ideological spectrum, there's still so many disagreements about strategy and, and you know, yeah. execution. It's just, it's difficult. Although I will say in terms of a progressive network, there is something in the works with numerous progressive hosts that should be launching next year. I don't know how much I could say yet, but look out for that because I think that it is important that the left uses this time to build up our media infrastructure because if we learned anything from 2016, 2020, it's that... We need it. I mean, what we have now is great, but we have we have to build upon that because I think that it's not enough. Um, and, and so look out for that. It's some some little bit of glimmer of optimism that I'll insert, and then the rest of this podcast I may be doomer, so I apologize. <laughs> no, you you are generally a very positive person. Like you give off, you you will talk about things that are obviously not positive things mm -hmm. because a lot of things are not positive things, but you have a very positive vibe. That's that makes me feel good because lately I feel like I've been almost overly doomer to where it's like it, it feels bad to recommend my podcast because <laughs> am I going to ruin someone's mood? Because I don't I don't want to do that. But it's like it's <laughs> some of the things that we talk about. They're so different or, or difficult rather to put like a positive spin on it. Like I did a story today where I was talking about a nurse um, who was sharing her experience uh, as a first responder and, and working with COVID patients and how she can't see your kid. And the story was like, yeah, it was gut wrenching. So it's like, I don't even know how to, but still I, I put like a little positive twist, like, okay, it's going to be rough, but maybe in May, you know, when the vaccine is widely distributed, it's, it's hard though, because it's like, I have to be real. Like if I'm, if I'm feeling optimistic about something, then I will share that optimism, but I feel like I can't like give people a false sense of hope. And, you know, we have to, we have to acknowledge that the times are relatively grim, but hopefully after 2020, comparatively speaking, you know, things will be a little bit better, but it's, you know, it, we're human beings. So it's, it's tough. And I always remind people if, if political commentary and news in general, get you down, tune out. It, it's, it's really important that you take time and it's not like you're, you're 
making yourself uninformed. It's that you're you're doing what you need to do to protect yourself psychologically because this is so overwhelming to deal yeah. with for for people. Um, and and that's on top of the stress that everyone just deals with in their everyday lives. You know, interpersonal relationships, their jobs, their school. Um, you can't let it bog you down. And if you do, then you have to make a change. So like myself, I always try to disconnect over the weekend. I've been trying to limit like my Twitter activity because I, I can get really addictive to Twitter. We all we all know. Um, and, and just try to like tune out at least for a little bit. And I, I yeah. make more work for myself when I come back on Mondays and I have to prep for the show. But I think that that extra work on Monday is is worth it to have like some mental space to just kind of like clear my head. Yeah, people don't realize, and I, I always use the term brain poison. Um, it's, you know, we'll, we'll meet people and, and people are so careful about what they eat and what they put in their bodies, but they're not so careful about what they put in their mind space. And it's really important. I, I mean, and I'm not just talking about the validity or the, you know, which sources are better sources, but just the entire vibe, you know, mm -hmm. when somebody, even if somebody, if somebody's telling you the truth, but they're just toxic about it. That's yeah. not good. <laughs> so, right. so truth in and of itself is not the whole thing that we look for in people that are delivering shitty information to us about our, our existence. It needs mm -hmm. to, it needs to be from a source that is, you know, relatable and empathetic. So, and I appreciate it's people like more. You do that. And it's really nice. I, I like to think of myself as sort of like hero support. Like we're going to be like that, that, because I mean, really, I don't want to address the news. I don't want to talk about those things, the political things. It's bad enough when I have to do it on my live stream. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't want to do that. That's not fun. I'd much rather interview people about um, regenerative farming and, you know, different stuff like that and put that information out there. But um, we need, I need people like you, because otherwise I would have to watch the news. <laughs> that's, that's totally it. And it's like, knowing that a lot of people exclusively um, get their news from indie media because it, it's nice to filter out the fluff yeah. and the BS. It is a lot of pressure because, you know, w when I say something, like a lot of the stuff that I have is just, it's up in here. Like I prep and I have my bullet points, but a lot of the numbers uh, that I read or articles that I read, they stick with me um, and I'll cite them frequently. And, you know, with time, you know, my, my brain kind of purges that out for the new information. And, and I worry that, Man, if I say something wrong or even say something that's technically correct, but I don't explain myself, I could be misinforming someone because I know that somebody might, you know, absorb what I say and then and um, and say it to their peers and misinform them. So it's a lot of pressure, but I understand. and I think it's really important and it's healthy because like when I when I get the news. I don't want to hear from like, if you watch these local news outlets, like I was at my mom's house, uh, I think it was last Thanksgiving, actually. Um, it was it was so jarring to me to watch local news again because they were like robots. And it's like it was weird because how they're how stuck you... in the 80s. They're it's <laughs> very or 90s even. I mean, they're it's really strange. Yeah. It, it it was strange to see that because it felt so like disconnected. And I don't like I don't want that. Like when I when I hear bad news, I want the human to be connected to it. Like I can't just say, oh well this many people are, are sick from this virus or this many people died and not like express the human emotion because we're, we're all human beings and suppressing yeah. that and pretending like it doesn't affect us. Like, I think that's weird to me. It's off putting like, and, and I've kind of been guilty of this as well. Like I, before in the past, I try to be like as professional as I can be. And so if I start laughing uncontrollably for no reason, <laughs> I'll try to like edit that out. But lately I've just been leaving that in because people like they, they just want to know that a human is talking to them oh, because especially now. Yeah. I think, so. I think that is, and, and that's always been the thing that I, that people have said most to me about people who've supported us is that I am not political. I'm not a politician. I just say what, you know, I'm just a regular person. People totally appreciate that. Yes. And it's just, it's, it's very relatable. And I think we don't see enough of that. And that's one of the um, issues I wanted to talk with you about, which is right now the current state of, platforms and censorship that we're that people that we're dealing with um what is i mean you probably know better than anybody whatever the current status is of where it's bad where people are headed like maybe what platforms are better but i mean i know you appreciate this as a huge problem mm -hmm. yeah it it really is um for youtube i will say it has gotten better 
um, in terms of algorithmic suppression, it's not like a blanket thing anymore. I think that at certain points in time, certain channels will do better than others. Currently, if you look at Kyle Kalinske, his growth is is limited in comparison with other channels. Um, and that's not because Kyle is doing anything that's bad. It's because right. of the algorithm. And I've been in that same predicament. And, you know, I, I've exchanged, you know, uh, analytics with other YouTubers like Jordan Sheridan, where all of a sudden... Yeah we're growing at a specific rate and then it just tr drops off of a cliff. That's not, that's not organic. Like right, I, there, right. there are times where you can say something that angers your audience. I've done it many times and you might see a little bit of a, a you know, a, a slight uptick in unsubscribes, but what we're seeing is unnatural suppression and YouTube has been okay, at least for my channel lately, but not all channels are affected equally and different platforms will, um, do different things at different periods of time. So what I mean is I, I've been trying to grow the Facebook page as much as I hate Facebook. Yeah. Uh, it is important that we compete on that platform, I think, because we need more than just like right wing memes of weird conspiracy theories and what have you. Uh, but I, my channel has been doing really good on Facebook, but at the same time, almost half of all of our videos on Facebook have been demonetized and Facebook itself is only, you know, new to, to monetization just in general. Uh, but Overall, I think that because there's an election, a lot of the suppression algorithmically is going to be kind of confined because we're all seeing better numbers. But once 2017 hits and people lose interest in the election gradually and naturally, uh, yeah. you know, you, you'll see a gradual drop off, but it's it's not going to be very natural. You know, if I can explain basically like what would appear to be, you know, a little bit of people losing interest, right. YouTube will take that and it exacerbate the problem. So it'll really start to deprioritize you. And that's, maybe I'll be wrong, but based on my experience, you know, it really comes in waves and it's, it's hard to navigate it, but I think I've gotten relatively good at, at navigating, you know, the, the social media suppression and algorithm as much as I can, at least. I think it's just so sad that we live where we have to do that. That's mm -hmm. that's sort of the point, like that there's these private companies that basically get to control what information is prioritized and what we get to see and even go as far as deplatforming people. And not, not that I'm an Alex Jones supporter, but mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I am pretty anti-censorship in in 99.9% .9 of the cases. Same here, yeah. So so that that's what the concern is to me is that yeah, there's people that are figuring out how to work the algorithm, but that whole big brother algorithm to me is the problem. And I and I feel like there needs to be a way almost to get out from under that. Yeah, I, I think that one really important thing that the left needs to do, and it's tough because we don't have many options, is to diversify the platforms that we appear on. I started that by, um, I, I'm now on Means TV. I'm streaming on Means TV. This is a, a worker-owned co-op, so it's not, you know, a, a, the parent, it doesn't have a parent company. Right, right. Um, and so, it's like, socialist. It, it's socialist. There are even some communists on the platform. Oh, no, and not, not communists. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if I say something that's controversial, uh, it doesn't get suppressed by an algorithm. If I say yeah. something on Means TV that just people are like, okay, I don't really care about that. It's natural. Like, it's not like I have to worry. And I think that this really is the way to go um, yeah. in the future. We kind of need our own space. Like, I don't, I'm not advocating for an echo chamber for leftists because that would be harmful in and of itself. But we do have to have some sort of alternative that does cater to to this. Uh, and one thing that I kind of talked about recently with um, some folks who watch independent media that I know personally is that, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of alternatives for leftist content for older generations who aren't as tech savvy as you and I. So like if you are yeah. in your in your 70s in a yeah. nursing home. Like you can't just turn on the TV and listen to like a leftist voice. The best that you get is MSNBC and that might be more harmful than like listening to nothing. And then we hate on the boomers, but they're not necessarily having the access to the level of information that we have. I mean, exactly. I think about that, like my parents, if they didn't have me saying, this is how you watch this and go on YouTube and watch that. Like, I don't know that they wouldn't still be sitting there and watching MSNBC. <clears throat> right, That that's so true. And you know, the same was true for my dad. Um, when he was in a nursing home, all that he would have on is CNN, not necessarily because, you know, he worshipped CNN like he wasn't a fan, but it, this was during the impeachment proceedings and he just wanted to get some information and that was all that he could find. There was no no channel he can turn to 
where he would just yeah. see like a different perspective and not even like, oh, somebody trying to skew <laughs> the facts, just like, you know, a, a non-corporate sanitized version of the news. It, it's difficult. And it's like, you know, th these folks don't have access to YouTube or don't even know how to use a computer in some cases. And there has to be some way to reach out to them. I know we're kind of like going on a, in a different direction, but no, you know, it's I, I think how do you reach that? How do you get, how do you get the message out against um, mainstream media Mm -hmm. to an audience that really doesn't know anything else because they're, they're not, they're not all foobar, you know, like they're, yeah. they're not. And it is, it's true. And I mean, or, or you just sit around and wait for more people to die off and more people to get registered to vote. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those two things, unfortunately, uh, but to, to, to touch on corporate media, what's interesting to me and what really I think speaks to the algorithmic suppression is that if you like go on the trending tab on YouTube and you look at news, um, you can click over like news gaming, the news. I mean, it's like these CBS clips and local news clips that have like 200 views when I mean, all of us on indie media are, are crushing that. Yeah. So how are we not trending? And how is it that like in 2015, you had Kyle Kolinsky and even myself in some instances when I was just starting out outperforming Fox News and MSNBC on YouTube anyways. But now all of a sudden they get millions of views. It's because they're prioritized because they are a more um, they're safer, right? For advertisers, they have their own advertisers. They don't have to worry on YouTube about what an MSNBC host is going to say about the military industrial complex. But I'm going to come out and say, no, we shouldn't invade right. Syria or whatever. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and they're going to not like that. So that's why they are being deprioritized.